Now, uh, what is the aim of this webinar today? Uh, we really would like to keep the discussion on EU foreign policy alive in, in a moment when almost all of our attention goes exclusively to, to the coronavirus crisis, and this is obviously very understandable, um, but other politics also continue which is particularly true for, for conflicts in this world. And um, now in the Israeli-Palestinian context in particular, um, after um, the, the Trump plan was published in, in earlier this year and, and the last round of, of the elections in Israel, um, there seems to be um, almost uh, an imminent threat of an, of an official annexation of what today already looks as de facto annexed parts of, of the West Bank. So as I said, this followed the Trump plan, which was published earlier this year and almost uh, pushed Israel in, in such a um, direction. Now, I think there are uh, two important points uh, to highlight here. Um, and, and the first, um, and this is obviously in my own assessment, everyone might have a different one, but uh, firstly, um, the Israeli government does not want to annex the whole of the West Bank, uh, but uh, because this would mean to give equal rights uh, to all Palestinians there. However, de facto, uh, with all inhabitants there under Israel's effective control, the equal rights issue is actually already pertinent. And an official annexation would only make it more pressing to address. Um, secondly, of course, annexation is, is a violation of international law. Uh, the Hague regulations and the Fourth Geneva Convention in particular. And in 2004, the International Court of Justice has actually already reminded all signatories of this convention of their obligations vis-a-vis -vis such a situation. Um, now, this is, is where the EU obviously comes in, um, and there have been discussion about this already. But what is maybe important to note is that the European Union becomes increasingly irrelevant in Israel and Palestine. And again, I would like to highlight uh, two points here. One is um, uh, the issue that there is no cohesiveness. So there are some member states, and lately that has been particularly Hungary, uh, which did not for the first time block council resolutions um, on uh, the conflict, which actually uh, denies the European Union a voice in it. It makes it unable to move. Um, but there is also a, a broader question here, of course, uh, which is if the EU is actually prepared uh, for such an annexation and how it could, could react. It, it seems that it doesn't really have a plan right now how the council or instead a lead, lead group of member states could actually react to this to preserve international principles and with this, an international rules-based order. Um, so this is why and where the seminar comes in. We will, of course, look at various dimensions and we'll from the local perspective move to the US one and then finally turn to the European Union. And let me briefly introduce, in fact, our amazing um, panel to you. Uh, so there is Tariq Bakuni, who is the International Crisis Group's analyst for Israel and Palestine. Um, his latest book, Hamas Contain, came out with Stanford University Press in 2018. Um, then we have Lara Friedman. She is the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace in the United States. And she is really a leading authority on US foreign policy in the Middle East, particularly on Israel-Palestine. Martin Konyaki is the director of the European Middle East Project, which is an independent civil society think tank in Brussels, which spe specializes on European policies um, towards Israel and Palestine. And I would say he is really one of the persons who knows European policies best. Um, and Dimitris Boris, he will act as our discussant today. As I already mentioned before, he's the scientific coordinator of EMINIA, and he's also assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam. So I wanted to join, uh, to thank all of you for, for joining us today. Um, and let me just close again with, with uh, two um, important um, uh, administrative things. Um, so um, as I said, please keep the microphones uh, muted. And um, I will, um, and if, if for the second part of the uh, webinar, where we have a discussion with questions uh, from all of you, um, please post these questions directly in the chat and uh, maybe with your name, what is the question and to whom you would like uh, to ask this. You can see in the software, there is the button, either you have it on the top or on the right side, which says chat. And there is two parts, one is everyone and uh, the other one is to someone particular. Um, so please uh, do not direct message me, but put it into the chat for everyone and I will monitor it and, and uh, post the questions um, to the speakers. 
in the second half. And I also uh, that uh, actually this, this, this webinar is, is registered, okay, so that you also have this uh, on your screen. And uh, with this, I will give over uh, to Tarek. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela, for the, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to participate on this panel. It's wonderful to be with you. But I also want to thank you, more importantly, this, for, for convening this panel. I think particularly at a time when everyone is, as you say, rightly focused on the coronavirus outbreak, it's really important for us to talk about political reality that's happening on the ground. <clears throat> Because even though this is in, in some ways a, a humanitarian and an economic crisis, it really can't be divorced from the political reality in which it exists. So particularly on Israel-Palestine, I've actually found COVID-19 to be a really uh, interesting prism through which to view the reality on the ground and through which to understand some of the developments that are happening. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I just want to give a very brief snapshot of what's happening on the ground now in relation to COVID-19, and then link that to the broader questions around the Trump plan and around what happens next before, before we move on to Laura and Martin. So as we all know, the different there are different geographic areas in Israel-Palestine, and each of them are responding very differently uh, to what is a pandemic that's shared across them. So in Israel itself, we have now more than 12,700 cases, and most of those, the vast majority of those, have been uh, Israeli Jews. So the number of cases that are recorded among the Palestinian citizens of Israel has been disproportionately low, and that actually led to a lot of questions at the beginning when those uh, numbers were being recorded. Now that there's greater testing that's being assigned to these communities, where there's greater action that's being uh, done in these communities, we're actually seeing the numbers rise quite rapidly. So even over the course of the, co the, course of the past 24 hours, there's a 10% rise in, in Umm al-Fahim. So now the numbers of registered cases of Palestinian citizens of Israel having uh, recorded uh, COVID-19 is about 500. Uh, Israel is still in lockdown and that's probably going to be revised and slowly moving, uh, the, the communities will move out of the lockdown beginning, beginning next week. From Israel, we can move into East Jerusalem, where we actually see, uh, as ever, East Jerusalem falling in the cracks between uh, particularly the communities of East Jerusalem that are within the municipality of Jerusalem, but on the eastern side of the separation barrier. We see those communities falling between the cracks. They don't get the, the kind of health uh, uh, sector uh, services that they require to deal with a pandemic of, uh, of this sort, uh, and only uh, as recently as this week after Adala, uh, the, the NGO petitioned the government to open clinics in these areas. Are these uh, communities receiving the kind of health care that they need to be having? And there's constantly uh, policing by the Israeli security forces of whatever activities that the Palestinian Authority is allowed or is not allowed to have in, in East Jerusalem. From there, we move on to the West Bank, where actually the very early on, we saw a very effective lockdown happening uh, after the first cases were discovered in Bethlehem. And what we saw was a directive coming from Israel's Minister of Defense for the West Bank to go into a lockdown. And since then, that's from early March, we have the PA operating very effective curfews and social distancing policies within areas A, uh, whereas the Israeli uh, army obviously and Kogat operating within areas B and C, which are the majority of the West Bank. So now Palestinians are unable to travel between the different urban centers within the West Bank, uh, given that that area is controlled by the Israeli army. And finally, I'm going to go into to Gaza, where we have uh, obviously a situation that could result in a, cat in a catastrophe if there is an outbreak. And uh, the way that the authorities in the Gaza Strip, particularly Hamas, has been dealing with this is to try to limit the entry of the virus. Because of the fact that the Gaza Strip exists under a blockade, that has been a relatively successful policy. There has been no entry of uh, the uh, individuals into the Gaza Strip uh, without being effectively quarantined for a period of two weeks. And the reason that I'm giving this uh, tour de force is to come up with a with a 
or, or to demonstrate a very simple reality, which is in each of those areas, whether we're looking at Israel itself, East Jerusalem, the West Bank, or the Gaza Strip, there is a single authority that is making the decision about how to respond to the coronavirus outbreak, and that's the Israeli government. The Israeli government is the sole authority, the sovereign, that is deciding how these different Palestinian communities can uh, and uh, can and should respond to the coronavirus outbreak, whether it's in the Gaza Strip, where the, where the Israeli government determines the level of medical supplies and equipments that are allowed to enter, or it's in the West Bank, where they determine how a lockdown between the different uh, urban centers within Area, area A is, is instituted and, and made effective. So in some ways, what COVID-19 has done is that it's removed a lot of the political language that policymakers often try to use in order to understand what is uh, uh, rightly a very complex situation. It removes all that political language and makes us, makes, us, makes us see it in its bare essence, which is that there's a single authority dealing with uh, the entirety of the Israel-Palestine or the, the, the land between the river and the sea. There's a single authority that's making all the sovereign decisions. And under that authority, different Palestinian uh, administrative authorities are able to implement those decisions. So in other ways, uh, what I'm trying to get to is to show that we have been for some time dealing with a one state reality of unequal rights, where Israeli Jews have civil political rights that Palestinians in that area do not enjoy. So in that sense, this is where I want to start talking about the Trump plan and to talk about how the Trump plan is currently existing in, in this landscape that I just talked about. The first thing to say is that even though the Israeli government and the different Palestinian authorities are very much engaged in dealing with the pandemic, the occupation is alive and well. So we, we see that not in only within the occupied territories where, for example, we have healthcare clinics healthcare clinics in East Jerusalem that are being uh, confiscated or demolished because uh, they are they exist in Area C or uh, the home demolitions and military incursions, uh, raids that are happening, uh, uh, arrests that are happening throughout the occupied territories. But we also see different aspects of that uh, within Israel itself, where the, the, the unequal treatment of the Palestinian citizens of Israel, uh, the, the, the marginalization and disenfranchisement of those citizens sense is also ongoing. So in all its aspects, the different kinds of discrimination that underpin both the citizenship and the occupation are ongoing, if not expanding under the under the, the pandemic. But what, what I want to do is to step back from that and talk about the bigger picture, which is the Trump plan, and try to show that actually uh, what we have on the ground now is the institutionalization or implementation of that plan. So the Trump plan obviously uh, calls for a Palestinian state, uh, which is dev devoid of all meanings of sovereignty and statehood. So it's only a Palestinian state by by name, and it's a it's a Palestinian state that. Uh, there was a, a change in the screen. I don't know if that happened to everyone, but um, so the, the Palestinian state is, is completely uh, devoid of all forms of sovereignty and it, it exists as separate islands within the West Bank and obviously as the Gaza Strip. That's the reality that we see today. And more than that, we see a reality where the Israeli government as well as the Americans are dealing with the Palestinian needs outside the context of politics and solely in the context of economics and humanitarian needs. So for example, in responding to, to the COVID-19, we see the Israelis coming out, the Israeli government coming out and saying that they're dealing with uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority in a mode that's cooperative. There's increasing cooperation between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, as of last night, the American government, the Trump administration, has come out and paid a, a foreign aid uh, a, a payment, a humanitarian aid, to the Palestinians. All this is part and parcel of the, of the Trump plan, which is to strip the Palestinian issue of its political nature and to focus on its humanitarian and economic nature. We see that very much happening through the lens of COVID. 
The other way that I think we need to be thinking about this uh, in terms of the continuation of uh, the, the implementation, I should say, of the Trump plan is the fact that the annexation committee that is that was formed between the, the, the Israeli government and the American government is ongoing. Uh, the, the processes of studying the maps of what, I, I agree with you, Daniela, it, it might not be the entirety of the West Bank that's annexed, but the, to, to determine what is annexed, which settlement blocks, is the Jordan Valley annexed, what what portions and how is the annexation happening from the west eastwards or from the east westwards? All those questions are still being explored. They're still being on, they're still ongoing, up to the point where the PLO itself is responding and calling onto Arab leaders as of this week to make sure that there is a plan against annexation. The the suggestion that the Trump plan is being suspended uh, is false. And the point to make here is that the Trump plan was never going to be a starting point of uh, a policy that will be implemented. The Trump plan is uh, merely showing the blueprint of what has been implemented and is in the course of being implemented for the past few years, not least since uh, the Trump administration's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. So it's in that light that we need to see uh, the Trump plan and understand it as a process that's ongoing even under the, co the cover of COVID-19. I just want to make two very quick points before I conclude. The first is to say that the Israeli elections are also showing us where the political establishment in Israel is at. So even uh, even with the paralysis that's happening now, and even if we might move to, to witness a fourth election, uh, the negotiations that happened between Netanyahu and Gantz show us quite well that even though the, the EU and members of the international community held on to Gantz as the savior, as someone who might move the Israelis away from Netanyahu's trajectory and back towards a Middle East peace process, the peace negotiations have revealed that that is false. I mean, the, the, sorry, the unity government negotiations have revealed that that's false. It's always been a false assumption. And the fact that Gantz has now acceded to the fact that sovereignty will be implemented and accepted that condition from Likud in the negotiations for the formation of a government show that this is never a question of if, but rather when and how. And that's how the EU should be thinking about the Israeli political system. Uh, the last thing that I want to be saying um, is that, you know, the COVID-19, uh, as it's happening and as the politics underneath it uh, towards annexation are ongoing, un un unhindered, uh, there is also a lasting impact of COVID-19. And that's the fact that Israel and the Palestinians are going to come out in a world order that's very different. And that's going to have its own uh, implications. For the Palestinian Authority, it's going to be living in a world where the kind of foreign aid and donations that it has are, are that, that it, it has enjoyed and that have actually betrayed it and that uh, allowed it to uh, survive is now much more questionable. So really when we're thinking about the Palestinian Authority as, a, as an authority that's going through a state building agenda, uh, that's relying on foreign donations, that that uh, reality becomes uh, questionable post COVID-19 when when the, the kind of support that the PA might be getting uh, is no longer as readily available. And so that I think also has implications on how we understand Israel and the, and the Palestinians. I'm going to stop there and, and uh, I hope I didn't take too much time. Well, thank you so much, Tariq. Um, this was really um, an excellent intervention. I think, uh, indeed, this um, observation that uh, during this crisis, we actually can very clearly see the structure of authority um, that happens, uh, that, that is um, established, and also, um, yeah, this reality that the Trump plan is actually not a plan, but a blueprint for what is already happening, I think, is, is indeed very important. Um, and the, with this, I would uh, give over to Lara Friedman. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm going to say less thank you for having me go after Tarek, who was so eloquent and said so much of the things that I would have liked to say, but he probably said them better than I would have. So I will try to pick up where he left off. Um, generally, when I speak to audiences in Europe about the Trump plan, for three years it was is there going to be a Trump plan? Do they have a plan? We're waiting for it. Do you think there's going to be something we can work with in that? And, and I've been something of a broken record from the very, very beginning of the Trump administration, which was stop worrying about what they put out in a plan and watch what they're doing, because that is the plan. And much as Tarek said, the Trump plan, when it came out, was more of a description of where we've been and, and how that culminates logically as opposed to something new. 
the the reason I raise that is not like, oh, well, look, we were all so smart. Um, but when we look at what happens next, I've been getting a lot of questions about, is the Trump plan dead with COVID? Is it going to, you know, they, there's nothing, in it. you know, what's going to happen now? Um, and and this was before yesterday when we learned about the 5 million and now they're saying that they're still planning to move in the Trump plan um, in the next few weeks. Um, but but I, I would say the same thing in maybe a different way now that I was saying for the past three years, which is, you know, take this administration seriously um, when they tell you their intentions on Israel-Palestine. And their intention on Israel-Palestine from the get-go, their, their key intention was to erase everything that went before since the start of the peace process, sow the earth with salt, and establish a new reality in which the Palestinians are utterly vanquished, and Israel has all of the legitimacy and authority with nobody arguing with them to keep whatever land they want to keep and to do really whatever they want to the Palestinians. And if the Palestinians agree to accept it and be nice little dominated people, that's fine, we'll call that peace. And if they don't, then they're terrorists and they're anti-Semites. Anyone who thinks that COVID or the chaos on the Israeli political domestic scene are somehow going to change that outlook from this administration is still failing to take this administration and the people in it seriously. Um, this is demonstrably, um, I argued this at the beginning and people said, I sort of suggested that I was not being, maybe not, it was an emotional response. I think it's, you've got to recognize this as an ideological administration, right? This isn't about, well, pragmatically, what can we do? The economy's tough or we need international support or, you know, give and take with COVID and stock market. No. This administration on Israel-Palestine is driven by an ideological goal, whether the president cares about the ideal ideology or not, or he thinks it works for him politically. I think it's probably more the latter than the former, but that's irrelevant. The, the structure, the policy is, is predicated on an ideological outlook, which has been articulated clearly, particularly by our ambassador to Israel, which pretty much says, this is an historic moment to finally achieve greater Israel. Judea and Samaria belongs to us the Jewish people, and under this president, we need to make sure that this can happen. That's me rewording him. He didn't use those, those exact words. Um, so as we look ahead to the, the rest of the Trump administration, um, you know, assuming he isn't reelected, there is the sense that, okay, we have to do everything we can before November elections to make sure that nothing can be rolled back by the next president. So if we're looking ahead with the Trump plan, you know, the $5 million, I, I very much agree with Tariq. This is about recasting U.S. engagement with Palestinians as a exclusively humanitarian, magnanimous gesture um, in that context. And they have been very clear, the, the, the ambassador, Ambassador Friedman, no relation, um, Ambassador Friedman said clearly this is not in any way changing our objection to aid to the, to the Palestinians. We haven't changed our policy on that. Um, but, but, you know, between now and November, people should expect that the U.S. is going to continue down the path of unequivocally and in their effort irrevocably giving Israel a green light and a kosher stamp and a shift in U.S. policy which says that Israel gets to keep the West Bank. And I actually believe that that will be as, as, as broad a statement as possible because um, while I agree with Daniela, when, when Israel looks at the West Bank, they don't want to annex all of those Palestinians. But by the same token, the principle of all of this land was given to us by God and it's ours to do what we want with, regardless of whether there's Palestinians on it, I think that principle is at the core of this ideology. And I don't think that it's going to be simply a matter of, okay, the U.S. between now and November is going to pick off different areas and say you can keep them. I think the principle is, and it's the principle that was established with our new policy on the Golan, right? If you get land in a defensive war, you get to keep it. And on top of that, Israel has, according to this line of thinking, the historic religious mandate given by God that this is their land. Um, so anyone who expects that not to continue to move forward, I think, is, is kidding themselves. Um, to the extent that there are limits in how quickly it's moving forward, I think those limits are less about COVID and more about the domestic political chaos in Israel. I think there is a, you know, who goes first question here. If this administration, if the Trump administration has done everything to be the wind beneath the wings of the annexationists inside Israel, at this point, absolutely as Tarek said, with this election, we've now seen the annexationist agenda completely normalized in the Israeli context. But it's kind of stopped in how fast it can go. 
And it may be, um, if the ideal position for the U.S. is to see it go in tandem with Israel or see Israel go ahead and then the U.S. give a kosher stamp to Israeli actions, I think right now there's a little bit of a, a who goes first problem. Um, I suspect that if Israel doesn't get its act together and, and move in a more decisive way to annexation between now and November, the U.S. will outpace it. Um, that, that would be my, my prediction if I were making a prediction. The, the question then becomes what happens with U.S. elections, and I don't want to go into too much detail here, and I've lost track of how much time I have, so Daniela, raise a hand when I start to talk for too long. Um, the, the question that I think a lot of folks are dealing with, and, and I've been hearing from my European colleagues, you know, since Trump was elected was, well, we have to just wait this out till the next election, right? Then, then we can have someone we can deal with. Um, I would say, first of all, you need to watch U.S. elections carefully. I don't think it is, anyone who thinks it's a foregone conclusion that we will have a, a one, a one administration, um, a, a one term Trump administration, I think is kidding themselves. Um, so I think it's, it needs to be taken very seriously. The idea that the next four years will be a continuation of what you've seen so far. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to think also if it's not, I mean, at this point, we know who the, the, the Democratic candidate will be. Um, and, and Vice President Biden, um, while he, I think that if people believe that, that this will be a return to status quo ante of the Obama era and that will save us, then they should go back and revisit the Obama era. <laughs> Um, and the fact, the fact is that, that where Trump took off, um, the Trump policy has its roots laid, the roots of the Trump policy are, are, are laid by the groundwork of all of the administrations that tried to make peace before him. And, and not only uh, did it poorly, but um, really is one own goal after another if the goal was actually peace and a two-state solution. Beyond that, I think it is safe to say if a Biden administration comes in, they are going to be looking very carefully at how they spend their political capital on this issue, because this is a high cost issue to engage in, even you know, regardless of who you are. Um, and there is going to be a lot that needs to be um, stopped, and that will cost political capital. There will some things that be, need to be undone or challenged somehow. Um, I've heard people say things cavalier -like, cavalierly like, well, the first thing a President, a President Biden could do is reopen the, uh, the PLO mission or move the U.S. Embassy back to Tel Aviv. Well, reopening the, the PLO mission in Washington requi would require a change in U.S. law, which means a very heavy lift with the U.S. Congress. Restarting aid for the Palestinians in any significant way would require a very heavy lift because we have the Taylor Force Act now. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, for the embassy, it requires two heavy lists. You have the PLO legislation, which says they're terrorists and can't have an admission. And you have the, uh, the Anti-Terrorism Clarification Act, which says that if they open the mission in Washington, they can be sued out of existence in U.S. courts. Um, I mean, it's things like this. It's the boring technical stuff. So you're going to have very, very heavy lifts just to prevent things from continuing on the course they are. On top of that, I think it's very likely you're going to have an administration that has some really lovely, brilliant people on board who we know from the Obama era, who really in their hearts believe that the most constructive thing the president could do right now is probably stop opposing all settlement construction. We heard this during the life of the Obama era, right? The idea that the, the, the path towards negotiations is to say, well, there are areas that everybody knows the Palestinian that Israel is going to keep. So let's stop opposing settlement construction in those areas and make that a down payment for negotiation. Um, we heard that from Dennis Ross in you know every three months in an op-ed. Um, and that sort of logic is what got us where we are today because that's the logic which says we'll do annexation without calling it annexation. The real difference now, if you look at the last few months, is people saying no, don't do annexation. And and I think it's important to say what they seem to be most worried about is the word annexation not the actual process of annexation. Um, and I don't think that that on its own is gonna change in the US. And I think that puts an enormous um, challenge before Europe and in some ways defines what are gonna be some of the, the most highest priority um, positions that Europe is going to have to stand firm with. And this is going to be, you know, allies are allowed to disagree. Um, and Europe has to, has to think about where it is going to choose, you know, what fights it's going to pick. But some of these fights are not really fights that it can walk away from because these, are, these fights are really about the fundamentals of international law, the fundamentals of the post-World uh, War II uh, rules-based world order. 
Um, and and I, I, I actually would argue that we can see if Trump is reelected, the continuation of the challenging relationship between Europe and the US. I think it's important to see that it would be in some ways as challenging, although it's easier to, to see where there could be constructive engagement, but as challenging um, with the Biden administration going forward. I'll stop there. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Lada. I, I thought it was really particularly interesting uh, to, to hear how actually Trump has set the stage so much already. So even if there is Biden or even if there's Trump and after, after other four years and he preferred to set the stage, um, how difficult it will actually be for another administration then to depart from that. And indeed, I think this is um, important for the Europeans to remember that um, uh, this is about um, not only a particular conflict, but this is about a whole uh, rules-based um, order um, in which this obviously plays into. Uh, and with this, uh, we are already with the Europeans, so I would give uh, the word to Martin now. Thank you, Daniela. Good afternoon. I hope you hear me well. Um, I'm based in Belgium, uh, so I will be indeed focusing very much on the EU side of uh, things. I'm based in Belgium, which also means that the Wi-Fi connection can be a little bit uh, shaky sometimes. So please let me know if there's there's an issue and I'll try to do something about it. Um, so I think I've been following um, discussions about the Trump plan and the Trump agenda um, here in the EU quite closely over, over the last uh, years. And I think uh, this, the, the, the plan specifically and the, and the wider agenda of the Trump administration, it's really been uh, the biggest test of the EU's position on Israel-Palestine um, over the last years, at least a decade, I would say. Uh, because the, the EU's position has been basically standing on two main pillars. One has been support for the two-state solution uh, and the other one has been international law. And uh, it's quite easy to make statements of um, support for, for these positions. But the real test comes is uh, when the um, United States, as the world superpower and um, an important ally of, of Europe, uh, comes up with an approach which is diametrically opposed to these principles and to these objectives. Uh, so that's really when uh, when you and when Europe uh, gets uh, tested about um, its its support for these principles. So the question has been for quite a long while, as we saw the Trump plan coming, um, how the Europeans would react. Would they say yes to the plan or would they say no? Um, and I think uh, this choice uh, is actually very consequential. It's not only some kind of theoretical thing. Because and, and it makes Europe actually relevant, perhaps more than before. On one hand, there's a lot of talk about Europe becoming irrelevant. But here, our position as Europeans actually matters a lot. Because um, if, we, if Europeans say yes to, uh, to the American plan, uh, then we legitimize it. Uh, and we legitimize also the implications it has on the ground, such as you know, acceptance of, of settlements and uh, uh, the, the um, denial of any injustices and violations resulting from, from settlements. Um, and we turn this also into a new, uh, uh, new international baseline, um, replacing the, the principles and parameters that the Europeans have been standing for. So replacing the idea of the two-state solution and, and international law and so on. Um, and also, uh, it isolates the Palestinians in, in their position, if, if the Europeans align more closely with the Americans. On the contrary, if the Europeans say no to the plan, then it's a way to preserve some of the international principles. Uh, again, international law, which is not only relevant for the two-state solution, but also for the possibility of a one-state solution. Um, if that becomes uh, an option at some point in the future. Um, so um, um, what happened um, was uh, that the EU uh, responses were neither yes or no, but, and of course this was sort of predictable, somewhere in between. And uh, if you look at the positions of different European states, we ended up with a kind of spectrum of positions. Um, some 
countries leaning closer to yes, yes to the Trump plan. And that's in particular the three um, kind of uh, states closest to that position. That's been Austria, um, Hungary, um, and, but also the UK, uh, which departed from the EU three days after the Trump plan was um, issued. And on the other side of the spectrum, the, the kind of most critical uh, states uh, have been Ireland, Luxembourg and Norway as a not a member of the EU, but a very close uh, partner in Europe. Um, but um, nobody said explicitly, yes, we welcome the American plan. Nobody said no. Uh, it was sort of in between. Uh, some of the supporters uh, or the more supporting states like the UK, um, they, they welcomed it, but diplomats have stressed afterwards, we didn't welcome the plan, we only welcomed the release. But uh, in practice, it's quite hard to see much of a difference uh, between those two. But um, I think what's more important than focusing on these differences in this case is, um, you know, uh, gradually the European positioning has sort of settled um, around a position which I would say is closer to an implicit no, a kind of polite no. You know, like uh, when you you disagree with your friend, but you're really afraid to say that explicitly, so um, you you are diplomatic about it. And and this position remains internally contradictory. So the, the, the position to which Europe has broadly come is, first of all, our position remains unchanged. We still support two-state solution. We still support international law. Secondly, the Trump plan departs from um, established parameters and principles for the two-state solution. That's the kind of way of saying no. Um, but uh, thirdly, um, we uh, want to see uh, a diplomatic process, a return to negotiations. Uh, we want to see something m moving forward. Um, and um, which incidentally is is the title of our of our discussion today moving forward but uh, actually uh, among the EU diplomats the phrase moving forward is currently being used mainly how can we move forward negotiations and so the, what's what's the problem or what's the contradiction there um, if the problem is if you if you go along into negotiations with the Americans um, you will end up uh, very likely uh, talking uh, and negotiating on their terms. Even if you start talking yourself about two-state solution and international law, uh, because of the asymmetry of power in these negotiations, because Americans have uh, um, uh, outsized uh, power and are seen as the leaders on, on, the, on this file, uh, it's very, very hard uh, to uh, hold your lines in, in such a process. And we have seen it historically with with the quartet uh, and other initiatives uh, repeatedly. Um, there's a huge risk if, if the Europeans go down this road that they will lend credence to the American plan, that they will kind of breathe life into it, and that they will undermine their own positions in, in that process. Um, so uh, for start, I think when we're talking about European response to the US plan, uh, it's important that Europeans do not cause more harm than good. And I think that's that's a real danger here. Um, now, these discussions on how to engage um, with um, 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 and how to support negotiations, etc., et uh, they have been now inhibited uh, because of the epidemic um, COVID-19. So it hasn't gone anywhere uh, so far, but uh, it could come back on the table. I think it's likely to come back on the table in one or another way. Um, the difficulty with it is also uh, if if uh, if you if you uh, basically uh, go down the route of working somehow with the American plan, maybe saying we want to improve that, but basically uh, working with it as the baseline. How can you then credibly oppose settlements and annexation if you actually support negotiations which are centered around a plan? which is designed to legitimize uh, and pave the way for, uh, for, the, for the annexation. So this is, I think, the biggest contradiction we have, um, the kind of schizophrenia that we have in the European approach now. Um, and uh, I, I should say uh, there is a parallel talk about uh, response to annexation. Uh, now, interestingly, that's a little bit different. The, the Trump plan is 
quite divisive and very very sensitive. Nobody wants to say no to it explicitly. On annexation, almost all the Europeans are very clearly opposed uh, to, to annexation. One could say all of them, with a possible exception of, of Hungary that we shall see. Um, uh, the UK, I think, is a, the, the most clear example of this sort of schizophrenia because the UK is a country which tends to welcome the American plan and propose negotiations on its basis, and at the same time opposing annexation as if one, as if the Trump plan was not annexation, but one is uh, A means B. Um, so um, the, the parallel talk uh, about responding to annexation within the EU hasn't gone very far so far either, has also been inhibited by the epidemic, which has prevented uh, discussions from uh, moving forward. Uh, but I expect that to come back on the table, especially as annexation becomes uh, more and more imminent. Uh, the European Union is unprepared uh, at the moment for the annexation happening. I said the Trump plan was the biggest test maybe over the last uh, 10 years of the EU's policy uh, on this issue. Uh, the annexation will be the next biggest test and probably even a, even a bigger one. And not only on this issue, but you know, like uh, Lara and Tarek have, have said, it's also about the wider international uh, order. Um, if, if you allow me, I would uh, maybe say something, um, try to say something positive towards the end. Um, which is uh, what can be done? Um, what can be uh, done by the EU um, differently, or what can be done in a constructive way? Instead of uh, devising ideas how to restart negotiations, how to bring back Palestinians to negotiations with the Americans, uh, uh, and you know, there's a European uh, impulse to promote discussion and dialogue because that's what European Union is about. Uh, so it's. <laughs> It's uh, kind of natural, but then uh, it's it's um, more productive to focus on negotiations with countries like Jordan and, if possible, other Arab countries to try to pull them as much as possible to uh, support for um, the agreed international uh, principles. Try to show as much unity as possible um, around them. Um, then uh, it is important to. Uh, really get serious about preparing measures uh, countering uh, the uh, the annexation uh, whether formal or or the de facto annexation which is ongoing anyway and be ready for the formal annexation which um, may happen uh, later this year uh, and uh, finally um, well there are many more things to do but just to just to give a third one uh, at this point uh, the EU should uh, call out much more clearly uh, what Tarek has called uh, one state reality of unequal rights, uh, and we could use the word apartheid um, here, which is uh, being formalized and consolidated through the current developments and, and through the Trump plan. You had a letter by 50 former foreign ministers a month ago who actually uh, said that uh, the Trump plan has, or the outcomes of the Trump plan would have characteristics similar to apartheid. So we see a really uh, mainstreaming of this notion that uh, this is where uh, the situation uh, is heading or, uh, or where it is um, already. Uh, and that also implies talking about uh, equal rights within the existing reality. Um, calling on Israel to ensure equal rights for um, all inhabitants of this one state reality without prejudging the final um, uh, solution uh, to, to the conflict, which isn't on the cards uh, at any point in the future. Thank you so much, Martin, uh, for highlighting, in fact, uh, the traps which actually the Trump plan opens up uh, to the Europeans and also, you know, for the ideas uh, you came in with. For the EU, instead of only being reactive to the US all the time, to actually become proactive. Um, I think that's very important to, to actually change this in the mindset of the Europeans, that they are also an actor and they can be proactive. Um, and um, with this, before we go into the discussion, um, we uh, give the word to Dimitris Buris, uh, who is the discussant. Thank you, Daniela, and uh, thank you, thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar.
LNTI for organizing this. I know it's it's a very difficult time for everyone uh, to be trying to organize these kind of events, and I really appreciate uh, all the work that you put, uh, and also all of our speakers uh, who talked already. And I mean, I've been keeping notes, and it's it's a little bit of a mess here, and I'm not sure how much how much I can add, but I would like to. To just summarize what has been said, because I think that all of our three speakers gave very good insights into into different dimensions of of what we are facing, and I would like to to push them uh, to to move forward and see what what can happen, or you know, see more clearly what the EU can do, uh, because I think it's quite clear that we cannot expect much from the US. Um, and also, I don't I don't want to abuse my time as a discussant, so I want to, to to be brief and give enough space and time for questions and answers. I think that one one of the main things which which is very clear, and I think no one uh, can say anything against this, is that the plan deliberately distances itself from many principles of international law and existing United Nations Security Council resolutions. Uh, it accepts that all settlements can remain under Israeli sovereignty. And, you know, this is completely against not only what the EU believes, but against what the international uh, community and the majority of the international community believes. Um, I think that in essence, and I think this is a link to what Lara said, that this is an, an ideological administration and this is an ideological uh, plan. And I think in essence it realizes, you know, the dreams of, of the far right, of the Israeli far right, in essence. Um, I think it's very clear that, you know, there is, there is a creeping annexation in the West Bank already. And this is what Tarek was, was already saying that in essence, you know, COVID-19 um, as well as the Trump plan, have helped to to the masks to fall off, in essence, and for everyone to see what has been happening throughout the last uh, throughout the last 25 years, at least, if not, you know, from 1967. Uh, and I'm I'm saying 25 or 30 based on Oslo, and you know, the idea that two states uh, of the two-state solution, which you know was established before that, but I think that. In essence, if if we are to be a bit positive, I think that both the plan and COVID-19, in essence, have pushed the international community to see very clearly what what has been happening and what what is happening on the ground. Also, what what Tarek said, I think this is one of of the main takeaways for all of us to keep in mind that, you know, one of the realities that have been exposed is that there is a single authority which is deciding about everything, not only in Israel proper, but also in Palestine and the occupied territories, and this is the Israeli government. Um, I think when, when, when it goes to what Lara mentioned uh, about, you know, what will happen with, with a possible second Trump term, I think we all kind of expect this, but for me, it's quite, quite sad to also uh, hear that, you know, even if Trump does not uh, win a second term, then there is not much of a policy change which, which should be expected. Uh, so this is something to also keep in mind. And going to, to what Martin mentioned about, about the EU approach, I think, I mean, the way I have followed the whole debate, uh, and I agree with your introductory remarks that the EU has become an irrelevant actor in the so-called Middle East peace process, if someone can still talk about this process. Um, and it has, it is becoming more and more irrelevant. And I think that we should think a little bit of the background. Uh, I don't want to argue that Brexit is the most important thing, but historically, it is the first time that the EU disintegrates. Uh, it is an important factor which affects the common foreign security policy, whether good or bad, but it still affects it. Uh, we also have the EU, you know, in the last decade coming out from an economic crisis, which brought a lot of divisions within the EU. And we also see that with COVID-19, 
uh, that these kind of differences re-emerge. And we see an EU which, which is again very divided uh, of, of how to respond internally. And all these internal divisions, it's, it's unavoidable that they affect the EU's external relations as well. And they are translated to the response which the EU has in its common foreign and security policy. I think that the first, the first reaction to Trump's plan, I think Martin was, was quite kind in the way he put it. But to me, it was super problematic because the first reaction didn't even mention international law. This came in the second reaction uh, by Borrell. Uh, and then, you know, it was a much stronger reaction. The second one uh, talking about steps to annexation that they could not pass unchallenged. Now, we, we are all quite aware of, the, of all this kind of declaratory diplomacy on behalf of the EU. And I don't want to underestimate this kind of diplomacy, but history has shown that this kind of diplomacy does not bring any fruit, right? Uh, we have seen a lot of times the EU trying to, to remind uh, and to bring to the discussion the two-state solution, but someone can say that not only the EU is becoming irrelevant, but it might be becoming delusional as well. And I think that all of the three speakers touched upon the reality on the ground uh, and the one state re reality which has been created uh, one way or another, um, while the EU still, you know, focuses on the two state solution. And I'm not saying that this is bad. It might be good to still have an actor out there uh, which believes in international law. But this has to come with actions, and declaratory diplomacy is not is not the way forward. Um, so we see we see a kind of hibernation and diplomatic paralysis on behalf of the EU, despite the fact that, as Martin also mentioned, this plan goes against all the EU's values and all of the EU's approach, fundamental approach with regard to this to this conflict. Um, another thing, I mean, Martin mentioned the quartet, and this is where I would I would disagree a little bit because I think that if we see it historically, and if we see the quartet, which has also become quite irrelevant, but I think that if we see it historically, the EU has managed to kind of affect policies of the quartet. And if someone, for example, looks at, if I'm not mistaken, it was 2012 or 2011 quartet statement. It feels that it's a copy and paste from me. You can uh, conclusions. So I wouldn't underestimate the importance of, of the quartet. And, you know, especially taking into account that both Russia uh, and the United Nations, you know, would go against this plan in the sense that, you know, it violates every principle of international law and it goes away from international law. Um, the argument that the EU is, is not prepared to respond, that it doesn't have a plan B, is also quite worrying because, frankly speaking, the EU has had a lot of years to prepare not only for the scenario of, of annexation, uh, but also of, you know, what happens if this thing called two-state solution is not realistic or not realistically implemented on the ground. Uh, the EU has had decades to prepare for this. So listening and hearing that the EU is not prepared, is unprepared at the moment to respond to this is, is very worrying. Um, and especially because the Trump plan and possible annexation, as Martin also pointed out, is a major uh, test for EU foreign policy as well. Um, so I think I think I leave it here just to summarize a little bit what what has been said. And I think I'll, I'll leave the rest of the time for questions and answers uh, from from our audience. But thank you all once again, both for your interventions, but also for organizing this webinar. Well, thanks so much uh, to, to you, Dimitris. I also have a takeaway. I think when you said that the Trump plan has 
help that the masks fall off. Um, actually, that uh, also maybe applies to the EU, which is exposed very much in its either inability or unwillingness to, to actually act or, or prepare. Um, yes, with this, I, I, um, so far I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is by Andrea Desi. Um, um, I, I will read it uh, to you. This goes to Martin. So first of all, Andrea Desi, my colleague, he thanks all the speakers uh, for the excellent talks. He asks, is there still a value to the quartet? Can it uh, remain relevant in these conditions? Can we imagine something new, a new format or contact group? And he also has a follow-up question, which is, we heard much from Europe about first having Sorry, now it left me. Uh, having to wait for the presentation of the Trump plan, then Europe had to wait for the Israeli elections. Has not the time for waiting for others um, ended? So, so that's um, Andrea's question. Uh, there is also a question of Krasimir Nikolov. I, I will give you the word uh, in a second, maybe, um, just before I take two other questions, um, which are here on the chat. One is from Muriel Asseburg from the SVP. Uh, thanks also from my side uh, for valuable inputs. I'm a bit at loss with the recurring idea that the EU could be a counterweight to the US-Israeli approach that Lara has depicted clearly. I think it has become more than clear that uh, EU member states do not want to weigh in strongly. So the EU will remain irrelevant with regards to the Middle East peace process. But if we accept that, what are the conclusions that follow from it, also with regards to a rights-based approach? Why and how would Europeans be more effective in implementing such an approach? I would be curious to get the speaker's take on that. Thank you, Muriel. Excellent question. And a question by uh, Tonia Dimou. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentations. Two questions for the speakers. What are the Trump peace plan security implications, taking into account that Israel would become responsible for a potentially unmanageable border and the safety of Israeli settlements surrounded by the proposed Palestinian state? How likely is the collapse of the Israel Jordan peace treaty because of Israeli unilateral annexations? Thanks, Antonia. Um, and um, maybe uh, Krasimir Nikolov, if you want to intervene for one second with your question. And, and then uh, we give over to the speakers. I, I just want to make a comment. I think uh, uh, the comment of Lara Friedman uh, about uh, the scenario where we have uh, a non-Trump administration after this autumn conducting uh, Trumpian policy, uh, this warning is very important because it could be uh, the uh, indication of a long-term trend away from the principles of uh, multilateral diplomacy, rule-based international order, uh, etc., etc. And uh, this is actually uh, the uh, aspect uh, which uh, I think is observed within Europe. Uh, I think we should not uh, uh, easily make comparisons between EU positions now and in EU positions 25 years ago, because uh, now, within only 10 years, the EU has changed and has changed away from uh, its capacity to conduct uh, uh, rule-based uh, policy and to be a normative actor, uh, because the EU cannot be any other actor in international politics. Uh, other than uh, norm-based actor and normative actor. And this is the capacity that the European Union is gradually losing, and this can be uh, 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 justified with many examples in many areas. So this characteristic changing uh, characteristic feature of the EU uh, will inevitably have an impact on its uh, policy with regard to the Middle East, Israel and Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think we, we go in, in order of the speakers. So Tarek, Lara and Martin, if, if you want to start, Tarek. I'll, I'll try to answer uh, briefly some of the questions. So in the, the quartet, I mean, uh, it, it, the, I think that the quartet has in some ways become irrelevant a long time before uh, the, the release of the Trump plan. Uh, and I'm going to point to a, to a specific set of policies that the quartet is still grappling with that I think has uh, shown us why it's in some ways crippled and unable to influence policy. 
there, there, the, the quartet conditions placed for the Palestinians in order to be recognized uh, in, in some ways have facilitated the current disunity between Hamas's government and the Palestinian Authority. Even when the Palestinians talk, uh, even when the Europeans and the EU and the Quartet talk about the need for Palestinian elections and the, the talk about the need for a, a renewal of some kind of Palestinian reunification and uh, support for the reconciliation process, that demand by the Quartet Coexists along with the re reconfirmation of the quartet conditions, which essentially makes it impossible for Hamas to be part of any kind of unity government that is accepted by uh, by the EU and by the West. So there is a kind of um, uh, schizophrenia. I mean, to use Martin's word, or or kind of is of uh, the quartet in which they are, they continue to be rooted in. Uh, in, in policies that have not only be, been detrimental, but have not adapted to the reality on the ground. So in some ways, the policies of the quartet have, have failed to even push forward the agenda of the two-state solution effectively. Uh, so that in some ways uh, makes it uh, irrelevant, but also makes it uh, incapable of being uh, the kind of um, or at least in its current formulation, I should say, incapable of offering the kind of diplomatic weight that could be a counterweight to the U.S. So if for the quartet to become a relevant actor, a lot of the policies that it's implemented to date have to be revised, taking into account reality uh, as it's emerged on the ground today. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. In terms of the question around what the EU role is, particularly in a rights-based approach, I mean, I think that the EU's role in, in, is, is that there are a lot of uh, things that uh, either the EU or European member states uh, can, can do. And I think Martin has outlined uh, the recommendations that he's outlined. Uh, I support wholeheartedly, including with uh, the beginning uh, uh, as, as a first step, recognizing the kind of reality uh, that has emerged on the ground against the backdrop of the peace process. Remaining, as, as Dimitris said, remaining focused on the diplomatic rhetoric has uh, its role, maybe in some places, but it has failed to change some of the dynamics that are becoming institutionalized and entrenched on the ground. Maintaining a focus on the two-state solution as if that uh, reality uh, is uh, both still achievable or certainly one that the EU is working towards uh, is actually more destructive than coming out and saying the two-state solution might still be our preferred option, but the current reality on the ground is a one-state reality, and that's the starting point for whatever policy that we need to be implementing going forward. So I just want to focus a bit more on what that means in terms of a rights-based approach. The European and EU policy has often been focused on a state-building agenda within the Palestinian territories. That assumes that a lot of the donations, a lot of the foreign aid, a lot of the economic interventions are coming in in order to build institutions of state. In some ways, that's the Fayyad policy, the, the go, going back to Salam Fayyad and the Palestinian uh, prime minister uh, about a decade ago. That no longer applies. The, the, the state building agenda of the Palestinian Authority has created a, a, a bloated authoritarian uh, administrative function that is completely committed to security coordination, not to state building or Palestinian rights. More than two thirds of the PA's budget goes towards security, not agriculture or healthcare or education. And that's only in the West Bank. The same Palestinian Authority, which is ostensibly to be the state, uh, of the Palestinian people imposes a siege on the Gaza Strip. So when we're thinking about the EU's role in terms of supporting uh, a state building agenda of the Palestinian Authority, that is still rooted in a two-state two solution and a peace process that no longer exists. So a lot of that uh, economic funds, a lot of that uh, financial largesse can go to, towards other areas within the Palestinians, whether it's building resilience, whether it's uh, allowing Palestinians in Area C to fight the encroachment of the Israeli settlements, whether it's allowing Palestinians to remain on the ground and to, to be able to cultivate the land and the, 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 the agricultural sector, which is actually the backbone of, of the Palestinian community. So a, a redirection of EU aid, even if on 
at the diplomatic level, it's not able to act as a counterweight to the U.S. would go a long, a long way. And that's not only on the Palestinian side. I mean, the EU is the biggest trade partner for Israel. And the EU has fallen far short of implementing even the basic Security Council resolutions that support the two-state solution, including Security Council Resolution 2334. So, if, so in, in this sense, not only is their commitment on a diplomatic level and their rhetorical level to the two-state solution uh, detached from the ground, they're also not implementing the, the basic policies that their own individual member states have to be held in accountable for in terms of differentiating between Israel and um, and the, the settlement. So obviously a whole a range of policies, a range of policies come out there, whether it's uh, boycotting settlement goods or, or, or preventing uh, Israeli Jews who are living on settlements from getting European visas. Uh, at some point, those policies need to be seen through a rights-based lens. How is the EU allowing Israeli Jews living in the West Bank to get visas to come to Europe when Palestinians living on those same lands are not able to do that? There is now a different, there is now a discrimination in terms of European policies and EU policies towards um, Israeli Jews and Palestinians in what is ostensibly the future Palestinian state. So a lot of the, the EU policy, a lot of the European policies can be revised to break out of the two-state state-building agenda and to adapt to a rights-based approach that, that focuses on the one-state reality of unequal rights. I'm just going to go through the, the last question very quickly because I want to give uh, space for the other speakers. Uh, I think that uh, if, if annexation does happen, uh, well, I mean, de facto annexation has already happened, but if de jure annexation happens and that policy is implemented explicitly and ostensibly, I do think that that is not only uh, a possible recipe for the collapse of an Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty, it's actually an existential risk to Jordan. So we're not only talking about the possible collapse of the peace treaty, we're talking about the, a possible uh, uh, existential period of instability for Jordan uh, itself. Uh, so it's, it's much bigger than that. And if we talk about you know, the implementation of uh, uh, the Trump plan, uh, a tortuous border, what does that mean for security for Israel? I mean, I think that is a recipe for uh, a, a, a complete absence of security because the, the, not only is that border not manageable, uh, it, it's also calling for the majority of the inhabitants of the land between the river and the sea now uh, being uh, held under apartheid-like conditions, which is always going to be a, 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 a factor for instability and uh, resistance, whether it's armed or otherwise. Thanks, Tarek. Lara? I have some notes. Um, <laughs> so, uh -oh. am, I am I muted? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, excellent. I had a little sign saying I was muted. Um, so just a couple of things. Um, first of all, I want to clarify. I am not suggesting that the stated policy of a Biden administration would be a continuation of the Trump policy. I think you would hear rhetoric. If, if there is a Biden administration, I think Europe will hear rhetoric that makes it feel a lot better. Um, I think you will hear a, a reassertion of the primacy of the two-state solution as our, as our desired outcome, et cetera, et cetera. What I am saying is that at this point, and this is not just about Trump, this predates Trump, we have structures in place in U.S. policy that make it very hard to significantly shift the course. This is a matter of U.S. law. Beyond that, you have as a matter of U.S. policy that is bipartisan. Let's talk about the differentiation policy of Europe. It is the policy of the U.S. to treat differentiation as BDS and illegitimate and to fight it. And that is bipartisan. And the conflation of settlements and Israel started under the Obama administration, not under the Trump administration. It was passed into law under the Obama administration. So for folks who think that what we're going to see if there is a Biden administration come in uh, clearly articulating a different worldview, which we're all going to feel a lot better about, realistically, the things that are going to be needed to, that they need to stop the worst things, things rushing ahead towards formal annexation, which I would expect them to try to stop, that is going to be a heavy lift politically in and of itself. Beyond that, I think you are going to see not a lot of political capital available. And I think you are going to see between the, the inbuilt limits on policy, which are now in law, again, bipartisan, and the, 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 um, 
the foreign policy pragmatists don't make the perfect the enemy of the good, which is a very Washington thing to say, which is generally used to justify policies that, um, that believe it. And to be the enemy of the good is what leads us to have people who say they are foreign policy pragmatists and, and not hardline greater Israel experts or greater Israel advocates saying things like, we shouldn't waste political capital opposing construction in areas that everyone knows Israel is going to keep. I mean, I sat in White House meetings in the Obama era having people in the Obama administration say to me, listen, why can't we, you know, we've been very effective. We said the E1 is a no-go. Everyone rallied around E1, and so Israel has seen that as a red line and hasn't built it. Why couldn't we look at the West Bank and do the same thing in West Bank and tell Israel clearly these are the red lines and you can't build these and stop wasting political capital fighting over every settlement unit? And I said to these officials back in the Obama era, you realize that if you do that, you're giving a green light to construction in every area where there's not a red line, and you're giving a flashing yellow light in the areas where there is a red line. It's a policy of annexation. Um, and I think that is going to be the kind of logic that comes back in when people in a new administration say, we can't go back to what is the Obama era um, narrative, or the narrative of the media in the Obama era, that we're fighting with Israel on everything. We don't want to be the anti-Israel, you know, administration. So just to clarify that. On the security challenge question, um, if they move ahead. <laughs> I said something the baby liked. Um, on the security challenge question, look, in terms of what the annexation, we already know what that looks like because we are in de facto annexation. You know, Israel deals with effectively annexation with a constantly hostile and, and a border that has conflict. And the answer is, in the name of legitimate self-defense as you argue it, you know, all, all means of self-defense are available and it is unapologetic and you say this is not our fault, they are terrorists, we are not, we're doing our best, and you have them mowing the lawn and all of that. In the West Bank, I would encourage people to think very clearly about what happens if we have annexation of most of the West Bank and the Palestinians left in the archipelago that would become the so-called Palestinian state. Um, I would encourage people to think about what happens to the Palestinian population that is inconveniently located outside that archipelago. And that is where words like transfer come in. Um, and that doesn't mean putting people on buses and shipping them out, but the idea that Israel is going to implement this and it is not going to be accompanied by, at the very least, I want people to think about things like the policy Israel has implemented now for years in the areas in the seam zone, right? That's the area between the, the uh, Israeli border, the, 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 the green line and the, the barrier, where you have things like families where the only people who are allowed to live there are the immediate family and no one can visit them. These are transfer policies. If you think about East Jerusalem, the center of life policies, it is inconceivable that Israel will annex at the scale that the Trump plan foresees or that they are talking about without implementing some kind of transfer. Fundamentally, if you listen to the greater Israel types in the U.S. government and the Israeli government, pragmatic questions of how will you make this work are irrelevant because, again, it's an ideological project. And an ideological project says the end is the goal that matters, and we will find the means to make it work, and it'll work out. Watch us. It's almost a, the, it, it, it's a, it's a self-effectuating self policy. Um, so there's that. On the quartet, I'm just going to say one thing. The quartet, from the perspective, perspective as a U.S. analyst, was designed to be ineffective. The quartet was created by the U.S. to, to European energies and make them futile. And it is effectively that. But could it be something else? Um, I, I, as a student of diplomacy, I think that one should take advantage of all the structures that are there. It's easier to repurpose an existing structure sometimes than to create a new one. I wouldn't say that it's impossible that the quartet could be useful again, perhaps in if there's a Biden administration, but it would have to require a very different um, approach by Europe. Um, if the European approach remains, listen, we're not going to lead, we're going to wait for you to lead, and we're not with you just help us figure out how we can support what you're doing, then the quartet in the future is going to be the same as the quartet in the past. Um, if Europe decides it wants to put some strength into that, I think it, it, it perhaps could be something else. Um, 
but more broadly on, on what the EU could do. I mean, some of this is not new. We've been saying this for years, whole line on international law, unity or possible. But frankly, member state actions matter here. Israelis care about Europe. They care about how Europe is seeing it and individual actions and rhetoric matter. And I think it's consistently undervalued when we have these conversations. Well, I would uh, give over to, to Martin and then maybe come back uh, to, to Lara. I, I'm very sorry for this. Um, before uh, going to Martin, um, I just a comment which, which Muriel Asseburg um, uh, wrote on the chat, which is uh, no doubt that European policies could be adapted to a rights based approach, approach. And that is what I have been arguing for quite a while. My question is rather how can Europeans be convinced that this is what they should do? I do not see the gap between rhetoric and action getting bridged. Rather, it is getting wider, as Krasimir has, has pointed out. So, Martin, if, if you could um, maybe also respond to that. Thank you. Sure. So, I hope you will hear me better than, <clears throat> than was the case with Lara uh, at the end. Um, so, let me start with uh, the rights-based approach and also with um, the comment made by Krasimir before that. Um, I uh, usually in discussions about the EU, I end up on the more critical side. Uh, but here, let me go uh, for for uh, for a brief moment into um, uh, let's call it a defensive mode. <laughs> um, so I think the EU hasn't uh, fundamentally departed from um, support for international law and international rule-based order. There is indeed a trend, uh, but I think it would only materialize basically if the European far right takes over political power in half or more uh, European member states. Then I think we would see a fundamental shift uh, in that regard. By the way, as we are, I think there are many Italians on this call, uh, last year when Salvini was in, in the Italian government, we uh, have witnessed uh, some very uh, worrying repositioning of uh, Italy exactly in relation to the Trump administration's agenda. Um, uh, people are used to seeing Hungary as the country which usually blocks common EU positions. But uh, for example, uh, when uh, the Trump administration recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, uh, it was Italy uh, at the time which uh, blocked a strong common um, EU position. Um, and But uh, again, uh, and Salvini is out for now, uh, he may come back in the future and we'll see where the trend goes, but I think for, for now the EU still uh, retains its firm support for uh, the international rules-based rule, rules um, order in its own self-interest. Um, and um, uh, we will, um, it is I think too, too early to, uh, or maybe too dark to say that uh, we, we are definitely uh, departing from that. Um, when it comes to the right, rights-based approach, so I'm I'm very sympathetic to uh, the rights-based approach and had many discussions about it. Uh, but I would say two things. One is the rights-based approach is already uh, partly or to quite a large degree component of the existing EU position and EU policy. The existing EU EU uh, policy does uh, contain international law. It contains international human rights law. It makes these statements, uh, it, it expresses these positions as part of its statements. It does uh, differentiate to a degree, for example, between Israel and the settlements. It does to a degree uh, support um, accountability, but often also not. Uh, but um, I think uh, the, the, uh, when we actually become concrete about what rights-based approach means, then we, we usually end up talking about the same things that can be perfectly linked to uh, an approach based around the two-state solution and even around the peace process. If you are in favor of peace process and negotiated two-state solution, it actually doesn't mean at all that you have to be against differentiation or against the International Criminal Court playing a role. On the contrary, I mean, if you look at almost any other negotiations and peace processes around the world, you see that they do uh, contain measures uh, of accountability, measures of pressure, uh, sanctions. Uh, think of, uh, um, you know, uh, Ukraine, the Minsk process, or think of the negotiations with, uh, with Iran and, and many others. Uh, so I think uh, it's uh, not that uh, simple or, or black and white. And I, I don't see uh, 
the headline of a rights-based uh, approach being able to kind of deliver a concrete new agenda um, uh, for, for the EU, which would be fundamentally different from uh, what is there now. At the end, it uh, comes down to uh, political will rather than th theoretical um, concepts. Uh, let me just address uh, the quartet very briefly. So I actually uh, agree that at times in the past, the quartet was uh, useful and the EU was able to uh, assert its positions there, for example, uh, in the context of the roadmap um, in 2003. Um, but um, uh, with, with uh, this administration and, and this moment, uh, I just, it's very hard to imagine how the quartet could at this moment play any useful role. Uh, so Tarek has mentioned that uh, the EU should uh, or could be, uh, try to be a counterweight or turn the quartet into a counterweight to the Trump administration. Uh, but, um, and uh, let's imagine that the Europeans join forces with the UN and with Russia and try to turn the quartet into a counterweight. But why would the Americans be interested in uh, joining the court discussions if they, if they know that uh, it is not on their terms? They will only go for uh, court diplomacy if it is centered around their agenda. And the Europeans should be realistic about it. Uh, one other possible scenario is that uh, people meet in the quartet and they come up with a wishy-washy statement about we all support a two-state solution. We have seen exactly this happening in the Security Council in February. There was a joint statement, everybody, the Americans, Europeans, supporting two-state solution with secure borders, etc. And uh, uh, I don't see this as an achievement or, or as something constructive. I think it actually very much plays into the American agenda of trying to dress up their plan as a two-state scheme and to legitimize it. Although it is a scheme which is designed to do away with all the international principles uh, that the Europeans have been standing for. So uh, it, it really is a, is a um, you know, potential trap. Finally, uh, I think uh, it's, uh, from this call, it's hard to come up with anything uh, kind of uh, uh, positive and, and forward-looking perhaps. And uh, uh, indeed, the outlook looks very, very bleak for the future with uh, annexation looming on the agenda uh, this year. Uh, but uh, um, maybe this can also be a wake-up call, and I was mentioning that before, to get the Europeans to start uh, discussing um, uh, concrete measures uh, that, uh, and there's a, a whole set of things that can be done uh, to uh, address and counteract the annexation, even if uh, we are not able uh, to prevent it, just as with uh, the annexation of Crimea. Um, and uh, I think it's most important that the Europeans do not become part of uh, the new uh, reality uh, post-annexation, that we are not drawn into it, that we do not become complicit in it, and that we do not legitimize it. Because if that happens, then there will be no international principles left that the Palestinians could hold on to if they rise up in the future uh, to demand their rights. Thanks, Martin. Um, Lada, maybe you want to, to uh, try to close your uh, statement now? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes? All right. I, I don't quite know where I left off. My last point that I want to make on what the EU can do, and I'm going to make an observation. Um, Tarek mentioned the Fayyad plan. We're still living in that context. Salam Fayyad was the and you know great plan. Everybody loved him. He was trying hard. We have for the first time really since Salam Fayyad, there is a moment created by Corona where you have a Palestinian Authority leadership at the local level and at the prime minister's level who appear to be developing domestic political legitimacy by delivering actual leadership to their people. It's striking to me how little anybody is showing interest in that, and that isn't to say that everything is great. But when the EU is looking for ways that it can engage at a time when the PA is begging the international community to stand up to annexation, it is striking to me how little interest there is in, in recognizing or bolstering good governance by the Palestinians. Um, I would su suggest that's something that the EU could be looking at as ways to push back against annexation, as ways to push back against the delegitimization 
of the Palestinian cause of Palestinian leadership. Um, it, it really, it, it's, and it's not for nothing. I mean, if you, I look at the right wing sites all the time and it almost seems in direct proportion to how well we see the Palestinians at a local level and at the grassroots, at the, at the, at the Shtaya level, dealing with the Corona challenge, we see more articles reminding us that the PA is ineffective and corrupt and you can't deal with these people. Um, I think that's important. I would add one thing just because I was looking it up while I was on mute. Um, if you look at Israel Hayom this week, the Sheldon Adelson newspaper, you will see the first article of its type that I've ever seen, which is an article explaining why the Jordan Treaty will survive annexation. We're already, you know, this is, the, they're having that same conversation. And again, it goes back to the ideological approach, which says, we'll do what we're going to do and the world will accept it. They'll see that we're right. And you, you warn it. This is an article, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the top articles on Israel Hayom today. The final thing I'll say, since I get the last word is, Europe matters. <laughs> you matter. Um, it is, it is, it is a, 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 you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If Europe says it doesn't matter what we do, so we're not going to do anything, it's self-fulfilling. If Europe looks at this and says we have our interests as Europe as a whole, as member states, and those interests include the international world order, international law, basic moral stuff, whatever, Europe can matter. Um, it is enormously frustrating sitting on this side of the pond listening for year after year with people saying, well, yes, we see the problem, but in the end, we're not going to be able to do anything, so we don't know. You see the problem. Yes, it's difficult. Not doing anything, you understand the costs of that. It really, the imperative to, to take a deep breath and, and, and figure out what you can do and what you will do, um, I mean, I don't say it's more important now than ever. It was more important. It was important three years ago. It, it's still important, and, and the possibility is still there. So. I will encourage you to feel like you have strength and feel like you need to figure out what to do with it. Well, thank you uh, so much, Lada, for believing in, in the Europeans also. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to really uh, thank all of you, uh, the speakers, really for your input, for your availability, availability to, to give your input uh, to, to um, the Eomania Consortium who participated, to everyone. Uh, who, who was participating here, who was listening, asking questions. Um, I think this, this was very important and, and very useful. And um, this is actually the first time we, we have done such a webinar in, in this uh, way. We, we do many webinars in Eomania and we have actually one upcoming in early June uh, where we will speak about how the coronavirus crisis is impacting on uh, refugees uh, in and from the Middle East. So, for, uh, follow us uh, if that interests you, and, and uh, you can then in the future also participate in this webinar. So thanks so much again uh, to everyone, and um, I look forward to, to further discussions with you in the future. Thank you so much.